Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this uh, lecture, I, we will actually see some problems. Uh, so, that will actually give you some uh, grip on what we have done so far. So, I will start with uh, this very elementary problem about uh, nilpotent uh, Lie algebras. So, here is the first problem. So, let uh, G be a finite dimensional nilpotent Lie algebra. Suppose i is an ideal inside G. So, let us assume i is non-zero ideal inside G. So, then we have the center of G intersection i is non-zero. Okay. So, this is a very non-trivial uh, fact. So, this actually directly follows from uh, this Engels theorem. So, let us uh, prove this. So, what is the proof? So, we can actually uh, look at the action of G on I via this adjoint action and then uh, we have some information about that action. We will just use that information to conclude this. So, note that G acts on I via adjoint action. So, what is the meaning of that? So, you can define this map sigma from G cross I to I uh, sending given by x comma y sends to bracket x y. Okay. Since I is an ideal, so this bracket x y will be element of I for all x in G and y in I. Okay. So, this is going to define as linear homomorphism from G to GL of I. So, this is actually Lie algebra homomorphism. So, in particularly if you look at the image of this phi of G inside GL of I. So, this will consisting of all nilpotent transformations. Why? Because so, G is given to be nilpotent. So, that implies if I look at add x for any x in G. So, that is actually going to define a nilpotent nilier transformation from G to G. So, because add x is nilpotent on G, so if you restrict add x to capital I, so that is also going to be nilpotent. So, that implies add x restricted to I is also nilpotent transformation. So, that means this phi of g if you think about it this consisting of all this add x restricted to i where x is coming from g. Okay. So, that means this set is actually as a subset of gl of i consisting of nilpotent transformations. So, this is all nilpotent transformations. So, then using our uh, Engels first version so, we can get a non-zero x in capital I such that that x will be killed by this action of G. So, G kills x. Okay. So, that means what? That means phi of y will kill x for all y in G. So, that will imply this bracket y x is 0 for all y in G. So, that means this x is indeed, indeed in the center. So, this x is inside the center of G intersection I. So, since x is by choice non-zero, so that proves that the center of G intersection I is actually non-zero. So, this completes the proof. Okay. So, we already proved that for G nilpotent Lie algebra, the center of that uh, nilpotent Lie algebra must be non-zero, but this exercise actually strengthens, strengthens that fact. So, it says that for any non-zero ideal, the center of G intersects that ideal non-trivial. So, this is a much more stronger uh, version of what we have seen already. So, now uh, we want to actually uh, give some characterization of uh, uh, this nilpotent uh, Lie algebras. Okay. So, let us start with the nilpotent Lie algebra. 
again all this Lie algebras are finite dimensional. So, if you start with ok now we will just start with the Lie algebra. So, if G is nilpotent then we know that any subalgebra and any quotient of G must be nilpotent ok. So, if G is nilpotent so then that implies any subalgebra and any quotient ok for k being ideal they are all both of them are nilpotent Lie algebras ok. So, now one can ask the converse. So, suppose if you know that there is an ideal so such that G mod Q mod k is nilpotent. So, whether can we conclude like k nilpotent plus G mod k is nilpotent from that can we conclude G is nilpotent. So, we have seen already some example like you can take a two dimensional non abelian Lie algebra that itself is actually gives us counter example that the converse of this is not true ok. So, so uh, with some additional conditions whether we can get G nilpotent. So, that is what uh, uh, we are going to see ok. So, this exercise answers that converse part with additional uh, requirement. So, what it is? So, let us look at it. So, you start with the Lie algebra G and then take k is ideal inside G ok. So, such that this G mod k is nilpotent. So, that is actually given to us and further what we assume we also assume add x restricted to k is nilpotent for all x in G ok. So, add x restricted to k will map k to k because k is being ideal inside G. So, then what we want to claim with this hypothesis we can say that G must be nilpotent. So, obviously, the converse is true if you start with uh, nilpotent Lie algebra then any ideal k will be uh, nilpotent in particularly like uh, G mod k is also nilpotent in particularly if you look at this add x restricted to k. So, that will be just uh, add x defined on k. So, that will be nilpotent. So, this this is in, in a way actually gives us characterization for nilpotent Lie algebras. But how one proves this? So, if you think about it this just follows from uh, again Engels theorem. So, recall what is Engels theorem. So, if you know that G is actually subalgebra of GLV and consisting of nilpotent transformations ok this is a finite dimensional uh, vector space ok. So, V is finite dimensional vector space. So, then uh, if you take G to inside GL of V uh, such that all elements of G are nilpotent transformations so then we proved that G must be nilpotent as a as an Lie algebra ok. So, now how do you use this theorem to prove that uh, here G is nilpotent. So, recall if you have a map T which is defined from V to V So, if you have a map T from V to V suppose you have a subspace W which is a T invariant. So, then you restrict T to W that defines a map from W to W and T also induces a map from V modulo W to V modulo W ok. So, you have two maps associated with this T if you have this W being T invariant subspace 
okay. So then for some reason if you know that these two maps are nilpotent transformations then using that you can say that T is nilpotent okay it is actually if and only if. So I will leave it to you to think about it okay T is nilpotent if and only if T restricted to W is also nilpotent and T bar is also nilpotent. So now using this exercise, so this is an exercise from linear algebra, you can see that this add x restricted to k is given to be already nilpotent, okay. Now if you look at add x bar which is a map from g mod k to g mod k, okay. Since g mod k is nilpotent, this add x bar will actually coincide with, this add x bar will coincide with add of x bar or x plus k okay. So that implies that uh, this add x bar is also nilpotent. So that implies that this add x bar is also nilpotent because g modulo k is nilpotent. So now this map and this map both are nilpotent. So that implies add x defined from g to g is nilpotent. So since it is nilpotent for all x and g so now using again Engels theorem you conclude that this add g is nilpotent but add g is isomorphic to g modulo the center of g. So up to center of g it is nilpotent so that implies g is nilpotent okay. So this implies add g is nilpotent and that implies that g is nilpotent so that we have already seen okay. So this proves that uh, uh, this characterization of uh, nilpotent, nilpotency. So now uh, we are going to see one important exercise about uh, inner and outer automorphism, sorry inner and outer derivations. So this is actually kind of very interesting exercise. Uh, so later we will see that uh, for semi simple Lie algebras. So what we are going to prove now is not going to happen okay. So let me first uh, state the result okay then I will make a remark later. So you start with again G being nilpotent Lie algebra. So let G be a fine dimensional nilpotent Lie algebra. Then the claim is there exist some outer derivation of G. So recall what is uh, inner derivation okay. So you have this add G so that is nothing but add X, X is coming from G okay. This is all called inner derivations and we saw that this inner derivations the, they actually sit inside this what is called derivations of G okay and this add G is indeed ideal inside this derivations of G and uh, what we want to call outer derivation is something that is not in add G okay. So some is at inside derivation of G is called outer if this is at is not in this add G okay. So that is the definition of our outer derivation. So now what we want to claim we will be able to produce one outer derivation of G if G is actually a finite dimensional nilpotent Lie algebra. So this actually requires some steps. So first step is we will actually find out ideal of co-dimension 1. So there exists ideal inside G of co-dimension 1. So that just follows from the fact that G is being soluble because G nilpotent implies G is soluble. So that means the derived algebra must be proper inside G okay. So now if you take any subspace that is actually contains this derived algebra 
and contained in G of co-dimension 1. So, that must be an ideal okay, of co-dimension 1 because any subspace that contains this derived algebra must be ideal. So, since uh, this is already one can choose it to be like co-dimension 1. So, you can see that this must be ideal of co-dimension 1. So, now what we do? So, you choose x inside g difference i. So, then you can see that g can be written as i direct sum c x. Okay. So, g has this very explicit uh, uh, explicit description. So, now note that if I actually look at this centralizer of this ideal i. Okay. So, the centralizer of ideal i, so which is those elements y in g such that y commutes with all elements of i. Okay. So, that is actually uh, the centralizer of i inside g. So, this is a subalgebra that we have already seen. So, our claim is this must be non-zero. So, this is my step 2. Okay. So, why this is actually non-zero? If you think about it, we already proved that center of G intersection I is actually non-zero. So, then if you take any eject from this center of G intersection I, then you can easily see that this eject must be inside C G of I. Okay. So, that makes this C G of I non-zero. So, now what we do? We actually choose N, okay, choose n in n such that this c g of i this is actually contained in g power n, but c g of i is not contained in g power n plus 1. Note that this g power n sequence okay, this uh, lower central series actually that converges to 0 okay, because g is being nilpotent. So, that implies at some point c g of i will be contained in g power n, but not in g power n plus 1. So, such a n exists there is no issue with that. So, then what we want to do? So, our step 4 we take e z naught which is inside this c g of i, but not in this g power n plus 1. Okay. Then using this is it not I am going to define a map delta from g to g. So, how delta is defined? So, you take delta of i to be 0 and then delta of x to be this is it not okay, and extend it linearly. So, note that g is nothing but i plus c x. So, that is what uh, we already observed. So, one can define it on this i and then x extend it linearly there is no issue. Now, what we want to claim? We want to claim this delta must be a derivation, delta is a derivation. So, that is actually a very simple check. So, if I take elements from this uh, Lie algebra G, so it looks like A plus some lambda x and then B plus lambda dash x okay, for some a b in capital I and lambda lambda dash in C. So, this is how any given elements will look like. So, then if you compute what is delta of this bracket A plus lambda x and then B plus lambda dash x. So, then you can see that. So, this has to be equal to 0. Why? Because this bracket A plus lambda x and B plus lambda dash x all will lie inside your ideal i. So, this is 0. Okay. So, the bracket a lambda x, b lambda dash x. So, this is element of i. So, by definition you get 0. So, to prove it is a derivation we need to check that this is also equal to delta of delta of a plus lambda x bracket with b plus lambda x plus a plus lambda x bracket with b plus lambda dash delta of lambda dash x. So, this is what we need to check. 
So, let us compute this right hand side separately. So, if you compute the right hand side separately then what you get? So, here you can see that delta of A is 0. So, you get lambda is at naught and then here you get B plus lambda dash X and then plus here you get A plus lambda X and this lambda of delta B is 0. So, uh, delta of X is Z naught. So, you get lambda dash Z naught. Okay. So, recall delta of X is Z naught and delta of I is 0. So, that is how delta is defined. So, that forces that this is equal to note that where this is Z naught is coming from. This Z naught is coming from the centralizer of I. So, in particularly Z naught bracket B will be 0. So, then it will give me lambda, lambda dash bracket Z naught comma X. Okay. And similarly, if you think about it, again Z naught will commute with Z naught will commute with A. So, you get this side again lambda, lambda dash bracket X Z naught. But note that this is Z naught X, this is X Z naught. So, it will be just uh, using the skew symmetric you can see that this is 0. Okay. So, that proves that delta is indeed a derivation. So, now what we need to check? We need to check delta is not coming from your inner derivation. So, on the contrary suppose assume that suppose delta is actually coming from let us say add g. Okay. So, then what happens? So, delta will be add z prime for some z prime in g. Okay. Now, note that this z naught is nothing but delta of x. So, that gives us this is exactly equal to z dash comma x. Okay. So, now what do we know about uh, this z naught. So, this z naught is not coming from g n plus 1 and this z naught sorry z naught is actually coming from the centralizer of i. So, these are all the two data that defines z naught. So, in particularly if I take delta of a which is 0 by definition then you get this is z dash comma a okay. and this is true for all a in i. So, that makes this z dash is inside the centralizer of this uh, i. But the centralizer of i if you if you actually go back to the choice of this n you can see that this centralizer of i is actually contained in g power n. Okay. So, that means this is inside g power n. So, this z dash is inside g power n. So, that forces that z dash x which is z naught is in g power n plus 1. Okay. But note that z naught is not in g power n plus 1. So, that leads to contradiction. Okay. So, that proves delta cannot be inner derivation. Okay. So, here is the remark which is actually will be proved later. Okay. In case if we deal with uh, what is called semi simple Lie algebra. So, if G is semi simple Lie algebra then one can prove that this add G is exactly equal to the derivation G. Okay. There are no outer derivations. So, only inner derivations are possible. Okay. So, this is actually a first thing that we will prove and the second thing if we actually think about it which may be I will prove it in the next class. This derivation G this will actually contain all its okay. So, one can talk about what is called this Jordan. Uh, Chevalier uh, decomposition okay, which will denote it by J C decomposition. So, for this actually 
you should uh, refer to the lecture that uh, that is about jordan chevalier decomposition okay so which which is proved you can actually refer to that lecture so what it says if i start with a linear operator on v so where v is finite dimensional again you can work over complex number no issue then this linear operator can be written as sum of two operators one is nilpotent part another one is the semi simple part and all this uh, n and s they will have uh, some uh, important properties for example this n and s they are unique so there exists unique nilpotent n and semi simple s such that this happens and n s commutes as well as n t commutes and s t commutes not only that this n and s both are given by polynomial in sin t so there exists polynomial p x and q x inside c x such that this p of capital t will be equal to n and then q of capital t will be equal to s okay so this is what called jordan uh, chevalier decomposition this is the additive version of that jordan decomposition so what one can prove okay for the derivations of g okay if i take delta inside derivations of g then we can write delta equal to delta s plus delta n where delta s is the semi simple part and delta s is delta n is the nilpotent part okay so what one can prove both delta s and delta n again that will be inside your derivation of g okay so that means semi simple part of a derivation is again a derivation nilpotent part of a derivation is again a derivation so that is what uh, this fact says and uh, these two facts are very very important facts which will be proved later okay so this i will prove it in next class and then we will use this to prove this uh, later okay okay i will proceed with uh, other problems uh, now i want to actually prove an identity which will be very much used later when we define what is called killing form okay this identity is actually nothing to do with uh, now killing form we don't need to know what is killing form but anyway uh, just to uh, this is a fact about uh, operators on some finite dimensional uh, vector space okay so here is the fourth exercise so you start with three operators x y z inside your endomorphism of v again assume that dimension v is finite okay that underlying assumption is always there so then what we can prove if you compute this trace of these uh, products okay the product xy the commutator pro and product with z okay that is equal to the trace of so you can actually shuffle them trace x bracket y z and then which is equal to trace of bracket y z x okay so these three things are same so how you prove this this is just to, you use this fact that trace of ab is same as trace of ba okay so this is just uses the fact trace of any ab is same as trace of ba for all ab inside your endomorphism of v okay now i will prove only the first part maybe i will leave it to you to prove the second part so the first part for example translate as follows if i take xy times z the bracket xy times z then you can see that this is xy z minus y x z okay so then if you are computing trace then the trace of this is same as trace of this minus trace of this okay then if you think about it so this is same as trace of x y z so i am not changing this and then but i will just shuffle this so then you can group it like y x and z then, then this becomes trace of z y x 
okay. So, now again you just shuffle them trace of x y z minus if you just keep z y one pair and then x as second pair then this becomes trace of x z y okay. Now you can see that I can take out trace because it is a linear map. So, then it gives us x times y z minus z y. So, which is exactly trace of x into bracket y z. So, this is the identity that we wanted okay. So, trace of bracket x y times z is same as trace of x into bracket y z. So, if you think about it the second identity is actually comes from the first identity. Anyway, I will leave it to you to check. So, now uh, I will actually kind of uh, recall some important facts about uh, nilpotent transformations because we have already come across a lot about uh, nilpotent transformations as well as semi simple transformations. Semi simple means diagonalizable, okay. So, I will actually kind of list out various characterizations of nilpotent transformations. Again uh, it is ok to work with uh, complex numbers ok. Again these uh, characterizations will actually differ if you actually work with uh, some other field. For example, if you work with real field uh, some of this characterization may not be true. I am just listing it for only complex numbers. So, what is this uh, characterization? What are, what are these? Let us see. So, again let uh, T be a map from V to V. So, it is a linear transformation ok. So, now you assume that dimension of V is finite ok. Again this is only true for finite dimensional. So, what we want to say the following are equivalent. So, I am not going to prove all of this uh, equivalences. So, most of them actually you know already. So, I am just recalling uh, all these facts ok. Uh, if you are not comfortable with uh, some of the things you should actually try to prove. So, all these facts just uh, involves elementary linear algebra nothing more. Maybe I will try to prove one or two uh, equivalence which you have not seen before. So, what I want to say? I want to say T is nilpotent. So, that is equivalent saying that the here is the trace condition the trace of T restricted to any invariant T invariant subspace that must be 0 and this is true for all T invariant subspace W of E. So, this is the first trace condition. The third condition the trace of again T restricted to W. Now, maybe I will use V lambda, maybe that is your familiar notation V lambda. So, that is 0. Again, this is true for all eigenspaces V lambda of capital V, okay, and true for any lambda in C. So, what is V lambda? V lambda those vectors in V such that this T V acts as lambda V. Note that V lambda could be 0 and V lambda is non-zero if and only if lambda is an Eigen value for this transformation T. Okay. The fourth condition which again uh, uses in terms of Eigen values. So, 0 is the only Eigen value. of t. So, what does it mean? It, it means that uh, 0 occurs as Eigen value with uh, dimension v number of multiplicities. So, again this can be rewritten in terms of the characteristic polynomial. If you take the characteristic polynomial of t then that must be of the form x power dimension v. The third the sixth condition this can be again told exactly using uh, what is called the minimal polynomial, the minimal polynomial of t of x. So, that should be some x power r for some 
r so that r can be made into less than or equal to dimension v okay so here this is characteristic polynomial and this is minimal polynomial okay so we already have six different characterization so now if we use basis and then write t in terms of some basis then we know that strictly upper triangular matrix with respect to some basis also is equivalent to nilpotent maps okay there exists a basis of v such that this t with respect to b is actually strictly upper triangular okay strictly upper triangular so now if we talk about in terms of this jordan uh, chevelli decomposition then you can see that the semi simple part of or the diagonalizable part of t must be zero okay so here is again another characterization which is again in terms of the trace okay so t is being nilpotent is equivalent to so we know that if t is nilpotent then the trace of t must be zero since t is nilpotent then all the powers of t also must be nilpotent so that actually says trace of t power k is zero for all any for all k in n and if you think about it this trace of t power k is zero for all k is actually equivalent to t being nilpotent so this is another criterion so i'll end with this 10th criterion which actually says if you take determinant of identity plus some epsilon times this t power i then if this is one okay this is true for all epsilon positive basically some small neighborhood in s enough but let's make it like positive not a problem and i is in n if this is true for this particular data so then you can claim that t is nilpotent okay what you can prove indeed if you think about it this is a determinant of identity plus epsilon times t so this will be in polynomial in epsilon so where the initial terms will be just identity okay sorry 1 plus trace of trace of this uh, t times epsilon plus etc so this is polynomial in epsilon so now if it is 1 you can see that if one only if this trace t must be zero okay so that makes trace t power i is zero using the given condition that's why we need uh, this uh, this to be true for some particular like smaller positive neighborhood of epsilon that is enough okay but anyway i have written it for any epsilon but again there are again other conditions also makes t nilpotent for example if you have w which is a t invariant subspace such that this t restricted to w is actually nilpotent and t bar which is defined from v modulo w to v modulo w so where t bar of v plus w is mapped to t v so this is nilpotent so then that implies actually t nilpotent for example you can take this w to be uh, just the kernel of t okay so that is good enough to prove the converse so there are various this characterizations for t being nilpotent so one should be very very familiar with all these things because we will use this left and right in uh, what is going to come
okay so that is why i have stated this again similarly one can list uh, uh, various characterization of semi simple linear transformations okay for example one of the necessary condition sorry one of the sufficient condition is that uh, if t has minimal polynomial and that has all distinct roots okay so minimal polynomial of t is having distinct roots will imply t is actually semi simple okay so there are again uh, various characterizations for semi simple i will advise you to revise that so i will actually uh, stop here we are running out of the time so i will continue again this problem solving session uh, with uh, some other problems thank you